end of the country, which is the Caribbean side, um, in, flew into um, Barranquilla, visited Santa Marta, and Chris is going to be talking about that. So who are the participants? Well, first of all, we have here the professor. That's Alex Mills. I think a lot of you know Alex. I, I think he's probably the, the premier birder in Simcoe County. And if anybody's been out on a trip with him, they know about that. And uh, as Chris said, he was sort of the um, instigator of this trip and the connection between all of us. Second, I think, again, most of us know our beloved Chris Evans here, and I call him the gearhead, and um, I don't think I have to explain why, and, and everyone knows that. Third, I've got here the veteran, that is Virgil Martin. Virgil was a friend right from back in the university days of Alex's. He lives in the Waterloo area. I call him the veteran because he'd already been to uh, Ecuador and Peru previously. So he um, had, uh, was most familiar with the South American bird life. And uh, he was really impressed with the uh, variety of birds in Colombia. I think it was by far the best trip he took there. Next we have who I call the Energizer Bunny. This is Jim Goltz, again, another old friend of Alex's from university days. None of the rest of us had ever met Jim, uh, but he was a great um, addition to the trip. Uh, he was the oldest of the six of us, um, but he was the far and away, I'd say, the most energetic. This is me, and I call myself the laggard because I was always looking for a hammock and a cerveza, and I did pretty well at finding both throughout most of Colombia. And finally, we have the twitcher, Mike Ferguson. He, again, was mentioned in... Uh, Chris's bio, we met him through our atlasing adventures in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. And he is a, a serious uh, birder. He was, in fact, got up at 2.30 this morning to drive to Ottawa. He lives in uh, Whitby, drove to Ottawa to see those, that bean goose and the Ross's goose. That's the kind of thing that Mike does, but he also sleeps on the back of trucks. One can't say enough about the importance of one's guides on a trip like this, and we had two of the best. They're much more than bird guides. They're interpreters, concierges, nannies, and security detail. Their knowledge of the birds was encyclopedic, both by sight and sound. Everyone involved with uh, Columbia Birdwatch, which is, by the way, the uh, company that we went with, um, for this tour, they organized everything. They're a Colombian based uh, company that's uh, uh, specifically for uh, bird trips, Columbia Bird Watch, and these were uh, guides hired by them. Everyone involved with Columbia Bird Watch was Colombian born and raised. And if one's contemplating a trip um, down there, I would really strongly recommend that you choose uh, uh, local guides. Um, they really added. Uh, a huge dimension to the trip in their local knowledge and not just of the birds, of the culture of us um, negotiating through restaurants and, uh, and uh, things like that. So a, a big plug for these amazing uh, Colombian guides. At each site, our main guide would enlist the services of a local guide, often a young or indigenous, as a way to support the local economy and reinforce the value of ecotourism. Transportation was in a comfortable miniva bus or and four by fours on the rough roads. We were all pleased that uh, there was a lot of walking involved, usually on very quiet roads or mountain trails. The walking was never very strenuous, mostly on level ground or downhill. Typically, the four by fours would take us up to the top of a mountain and we'd walk down them. So it was very nice and and really most of our birding was was from uh, <clears throat> from by walking our first base was Aracana lodge just opened by the owner of columbia bird watch in a beautiful pastoral setting and well situated to explore the birding opportunities around cali 
some of our best or at least our most relaxing birding was in the gardens of the beautiful places we stayed. The hilly landscape around Cali was a delight to wander in. Most lodges and several stops in our first few days um, included hummingbird feeders and fruit feeders. So this is a typical stop. This would be a place where they'd serve us delightful Colombian coffee. And we'd just uh, sit underneath an, an awning and look out into the forest where they had uh, feeders set up. If you visited Colombia and only looked at hummingbird feeders, I think you'd um, think it was a worthwhile trip. I'm just going to go through a gallery of a few of just a, a few of the hummingbirds that we saw. These are crowned wood nymphs. It's another one. I should say something about the photos here. Um, all of the photos in this uh, presentation were taken by us and by us I don't mean me <laughs> I didn't dig any of the well actually some of the scenery pictures are mine but the birds were mostly done by uh, Virgil and Chris and a few by Jim um, and uh, so these are not pictures that we took off the internet these are pictures that we took ourselves there's a brown violet ear a couple having a little fight around a feeder a white-necked Jacobin. I like just saying the names of some of these hummingbirds. There's a violet-tailed sylph, and I think a female violet-tailed sylph. Here's a Rufus Gate Hill Star. A tourmaline sun angel. Bronzy Inca, greenish puff leg. You can see why they call them a puff leg. <clears throat> Velvet purple coronet. The amazing booted racket tail. These, uh, that's a gallery of uh, hummingbirds taken from various places uh, on the trip. And a lot of the, uh, Hummingbirds are very localized, um, have a local range geographically, and are also um, confined to a certain elevation as well in the mountains. After hummingbirds, perhaps the next most delightful group of birds might be the tanagers. Again, we basically have one tanager here, the scarlet tanager, which is a great bird to see um, up here. Uh, and they have about the same number of, uh, of, humming, of tanagers as hummingbirds. They are attracted by platforms on which overripe fruit are, fruit are placed, providing stunning views of these wildly colored, medium-sized fruit eaters, which actually comprise a variety of different families. So again, I'm just going to give you a little valor gallery of um, tanagers. They are wild colored birds. This is a silver throated eating a papaya, I think. Black chinned mountain tanager, crimson back tanager, golden nate tanager, gray and gold tanager, the unfortunately named scrub tanager. I think it deserves a better name. Tawny crested, white shouldered, swallow tanager, beautiful thing. It was hard to get a picture of because it was always way up high in the trees. Grass green tanager and golden ringed tanager, who we watched for several minutes clubbing this poor anole on the ground to tenderize it. A gallery of other birds frequently join tanagers at the feeders. This is a female red-headed barbet without the red head. There's the male with his red head. 
crimson rump toucanets or a variety of different toucanets uh, and toucans that we saw. Beautiful green honey creeper. And this bird I saw in the field guides before I even went and was dying to see and was rewarded. A toucan barbet. Looks like somebody used paint by numbers on that bird. So once we left the relative comfort of uh, bird feeders and hummingbird feeders, we took a short drive to the Pacific Slope of the Andes and a walk through Farayonis National Park on mountain roads. So this gave us much more of an idea of thick uh, cloud forest or rainforest. There's the group of us there. I should mention also in addition to guides, we had wonderful drivers and they were quite happy to stop anywhere along the way that birds showed up just like they do here when we're driving around. This is an interesting bird, a cattle tyrant. It acts very much like our cow bird. This is, he's sitting on top of the back of a cow here, but it's um, probably more closely related to our kingbird, but it uh, had um, taken this niche there that our cowbirds do here. Uh, just like uh, here at home, driving around was a good place to see uh, various raptors. This is a beautiful double toothed kite. And you couldn't forget to look up in the sky where you never knew what you might see soaring up there. Here we have a short tailed hawk with white collared swifts surrounding it. This gives you an idea of why it was so essential to have a guide. You might wonder why I have this random picture of a, of, of a bank, uh, a, a road cut, um, not much to see here, but if you zoom in right to the middle of this picture, there is a lyre-tailed nightjar, a bird that's uh, in the same uh, family as our, our uh, whippoorwill. And as you wandered through the, the um, forest, this is again where the guides really came, uh, were indispensable. There's all kinds of little birds in the forest that are just extremely hard to spot. Um, usually they were identified first by sound. Um, here's a, a, a mustached puff bird, a bar crested ant shrike. There's a bunch of different birds called ant something or other. Ant shrikes, ant pittas, ant birds. All of them follow, uh, go in the forest and follow uh, huge uh, aggr aggregations of ants on the ground. And uh, if you find a big group of ants, you might find quite a number of these ant birds. So that's an ant shrike. Cinnamon Bacard, beautiful uh, song of the Andean solitaire. And another group that was well represented in Colombia orange belly, this is an orange bellied euphonia. There is a bunch of different finch-like euphonias. After we left Ferraonis, we drove to, through a town called La Leonera and to the Finca Manzaneras to seek a very special bird. Here we had to get into um, four by fours uh, in the back of four by fours to get to this beautiful Finca in the mountains where we walked, hiked from the Finca down this valley down deep into the valley here in order to see, to witness an Andean cock of the rock lek. Cock of the rocks are, uh, are a really um, sought after bird to see in Colombia. And they are dependable because they are a lek, a bird that um, creates leks. And what that is, is uh, uh, a place where a bunch of the males congregate. And in the case of Cock of the Rock, uh, these leks can exist for decades. I think this one was around for um, several decades. And uh, at the pretty much the same time every day, they um, meet there from all through the uh, valley and they display and show off and fight with other males, all in the hopes that a female will show up. The chance of a female showing up when we were there was very slim and we never saw one, but that doesn't stop the males from every day showing up at the same time, punching in and uh, doing their little courtship display. So we had some wonderful views over an hour or more of these incredible Andean cock of the rocks.
There were some other nice birds at the finca. This is a Colombian chachalaca. Chachalacas are sort of like our grouse or pheasants. Um, they're very, very vocal. Um, you hear them all throughout Colombia, um, but they can be a little secretive and that was a nice look at one. The southern lapwing is, I'd say, um, somewhat similar to our killdeer, uh, wandering around on the ground like, uh, like plovers do. The saffron finch, a gorgeous little thing and yet quite common. It's actually, um, you can see it in, uh, flying around in the cities. The Cauca River flows through Cali <clears throat> and northwards between the West and Central Andes. Below Cali, it forms the Sanso Lagoons, a series of wetland marshes and riparian dry forest. This provided our best opportunity for water birds on the trip as we walked the beautiful riparian pathways. Locals were busy harvesting sand from the bottom of the river in huge canoes and weighing them down almost to the gunnels. So as I said, this was our best shot at water birds and we saw a lot of them. This is a wattled jacana. The jacanas are those birds that um, have the huge, huge toes, allowing them to walk on uh, floating vegetation. If you look carefully along the bank, you find all kinds of uh, wading birds. Uh, at the top here, we have a bare-faced ibis, and down below, a striated heron uh, that is a little bit like our green heron. This is a real treat for me. It's quite common in the Sanso Lagoons is a snail kite with a very, very heavily hooked bill, which is um, perfectly uh, adapted to extract the meat out of snails, which were abundant in the, in the area. So a lot of different cuckoos in Colombia, and this was uh, one of them, and one I thought was quite lovely. It's called the dwarf cuckoo. Like cuckoos here, they're really secretive, so to get a picture of one is quite a, a feat. And then there was three different species of annies. This is the smooth-billed annie. Annies are uh, sort of big black birds, maybe a little bit like a cross between our grackles and a crow. Another real treat uh, to see down in the um, subtropics is the common patu. It's an interesting bird related to the night jars, in other words, related to the, um, to the whippoorwill um, and they are nocturnal. During the day, they perch and roost in such a way as to look exactly like the extension of a stump. Again, it often takes a, the keen eyes of, of your guide to spot one. <clears throat> At night, they sally forth from the stump uh, and branches and, uh, and catch uh, uh, insects on the wing. There's a beautiful kokoi heron, something like our great blue, but sort of black and white. There were parrots all over Colombia, as you might expect. This is a spectacled parrotlet. Um, this gives you a little bit of, a, of an idea of what a challenge they are. A, they blend in really well. B, there's a bunch of them that look more or less the same. They're a really challenged to identify. And C, they fly around really, really quickly. Um, they're noisy, so you know they're around, but oftentimes they're just a flash as they fly from tree to tree. In the old days, you might think that I put a slide in backwards for this picture, but this is actually a spectacled parrotlet hanging upside down from the top of a, a palapa. There are a number of owls in uh, Colombia as well. Um, and several different species of screech owl. Um, they're hard to identify mostly by their hoots or by their range. This is the most widely um, distributed one. The, the tropical screech owl really looks just like our Eastern screech owl. So once we left the Sanso Lagoons, we headed to Montezuma Lodge. It's one of Colombia's must see birding spots it's located at the base of Tatama National Park, uh, and it's the starting point for a 13 kilometer, 1,400 meter elevation drive to the summit of Cerro Montezuma. This is the heart of the famed Chaco ecoregion of Colombia, one of the world's most biodiverse regions. Land Rovers drove us to the top, and in two days, we descended through cloud and rainforest 
overwhelmed by birds, plants, and insects every step of the way. The road exists to supply a communications installation and small military outpost. The Colombian military seemed excited to see us and greeted us warmly. This might be a good time to speak about security in Colombia. It's often the first question people ask me when I say we went there. Um, I think we all remember uh, the days of when Colombia was a no-go zone. It was uh, riven by civil war amongst several factions, uh, some uh, leftist uh, terrorists called, uh, oh, I forget the name now, but also some uh, fascist uh, militia and the government as well. And um, kidnapping was rampant. Even the owner of Columbia Birdwatch uh, really couldn't live in the country for about a 10 year period. Um, and so some of the areas uh, that we visited would have been, um, you, you couldn't have visited 20 years ago. But around then uh, the government started signing peace treaties uh, with some of the, um, the uh, military groups and uh, things started to uh, become peaceful pretty quickly. And I have to say that I think it was probably birders that opened up some of these areas faster than anyone else. Uh, birders know Colombia is uh, a very, very uh, desirable area and we're really keen to get there. And I think birding really has done a big job for opening up uh, parts of Colombia. Uh, notwithstanding this picture where, we, where the military came down to visit us with their, with their guns, we felt very, very safe. Uh, in all parts of Colombia, although there was a big military presence almost everywhere we went. The Montezuma Road was a garden of gorgeous flowering plants and ferns. Over 450 species of orchids alone have been recorded here. If you weren't a birder at all, if you were just a, um, interested in uh, botany, uh, you, you would have uh, had a field day there. It's just an interesting adaptation to attract pollinators when your flowers aren't too showy, red patches on your leaves. Despite the abundance of hummingbirds and tanagers, perhaps the most numerous group of birds and the most challenging to ID are the flycatchers. Some are easy, this, the cinnamon flycatcher, this common toady flycatcher, but a lot of them look like this. This is, happens to be a dusky capped, but there's, I don't think I'd exaggerate to say dozens that look a lot like this, not unlike our Ampidnax flycatchers. <coughs> flycatcher like is this dux, dusky chlorospingus. And then the understory uh, was just full of little, uh, beautiful little birds. This is the olive finch, lanceolated monklet, golden olive woodpecker. There are a lot of woodpeckers, uh, ones that this are a bit reminiscent of our red-bellied woodpecker and big ones like our pileated. I love this little bird, slaty-backed chat tyrant like a little bit like a European robin. Fruit eaters are an also inter interesting group. This is a barred fruit eater. They're kind of plump like a pigeon. Again, very difficult to photograph. They're very secretive and high up in the trees eating fruit. Here we have some of the most sought after birds in Colombia. This is the tawny throated leaf tosser. And this is the really rare and elusive oscillated tapaculo, an example of two of the most sought after and challenging groups in the neotropics. The leaf tosser is, an, is called, a group called the oven birds. And this of course is a tapaculo of which there are a bunch. Uh, you add to those the ver variety of wrens. They're secretive, cryptic, and very hard to spot. They live deep in the understory and, and all of them have very, very limited ranges. 
The warmth and humidity and abundant flowering plants created perfect conditions for a wide variety of insects too. Yet oddly enough, nowhere in Colombia that we went did we experience uh, biting insects. We, we saw, we experienced virtually no biting insects, uh, which was a nice bonus for us. This crazy looking uh, monkey grasshopper, I think, or something. And what better uh, picture to end my part of the talk and hand over to Chris than to uh, have this picture of a lovely dragonfly, uh, meadowhawk, I believe. And at that, I will pass this on to Chris. There may be a little bit of a delay here, but I'm going to stop my sharing and Chris is going to start. So take it away. <laughs> okay. I didn't click soon enough, but I'm starting to take it away. Now, where's my... Uh... This went much smoother in the practice. I can't see my... Oh, here. There we go. I was watching Ian on the screen and for some reason the whole thing disappeared. So here I am, I'm gonna share the screen with you again. And I'll start where Ian uh, left off. And uh, thank you very much, Ian, that was fantastic. Um, and uh, you almost got the name of this little guy, right? This is a flame-tailed pond hawk. Uh, yeah, the, it was really a, a challenge to try and figure out names for all these insects because you can imagine trying to find a field and go from there. So I'm going to, uh, as you can see, I've, uh, I've donned my garb. I've got my binoculars with me and my hat on, and I've got a little friend beside me because I'm a, a bug guy as well as a bird guy. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, uh, get into this slideshow. And I'm going to switch into the birds fairly quickly for all you birders. Uh, fear not. And I'm going to uh, take you on a little airplane ride. So here we go. So uh, just to show you, uh, so Ian finished off here in the Tatama National Park up at the Montezuma Lodge and he drove down through the mountains to Pereira Airport and uh, hopped on a plane. On the way down, of course, we saw spectacular birds the whole way to the airport. So it was a, a bit of a trip in itself. Uh, flew up to Rio Acha and uh, which is on this uh, big peninsula here uh, on the Caribbean coast called the Wahira Peninsula. Uh, and Rio Acha is in the Wahira Desert, which is partly sh shared by, what's, what's the problem? There's no screen sharing happening. Chris, I don't, th don't think you've actually shared your screen yet. Oh, I didn't push the button. <laughs> Too many buttons. <laughs> Th Thanks. Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> Ruth is also signed in and she's uh, she was coaching me on that. I didn't realize anything was wrong there. Sorry about that. Uh, let me start that uh, little demonstration again here. So we flew from Tatama National Park here at the Montezuma Lodge uh, to P Pereira uh, and then flew from there to Bogota and caught that connecting flight then to Rio Acha up in this uh, Wahira Peninsula. My apologies for my ineptness with, uh, with uh, Zoom meetings. Um, so anyways, so Rio Acha is in the Wahira Desert. Uh, there was a, a fantastic festival going on there. Um, I was too bushed to really participate, but we could see it from our balcony. It was just spectacular. Uh, some of us did wander out into it. Uh, but this is a birding trip, so I'll, I'll get right down to, to business here and uh, we'll carry on from there. I guess I'll, I'll just give you a little brief uh, view of what we're going to do. So we stayed overnight at Rio Acha and then uh, went to this Los Flamencos National Park first, which is in this Wahira Desert. Uh, so again, it's in the rain shadow of this uh, Santa Marta Mar Mountains and is another completely different ecosystem to anywhere else in uh, um, Colombia. And then we drove from there to uh, Terona National Park, 
uh, and um, now it was closed uh, for the most part, but we uh, I'll, I'll, I'll describe more about that later. It's at the in the foothills at the very base of the Santa Marta mountain range, which is, by the way, the tallest and uh, steepest uh, coastal mountain range in the world. So again, as you can imagine, it's, it's disconnected from the other mountain ranges and you get all that stratification of different species at different elevations. So it has its own Santa Marta end endemics, not just Colombian, and not just endemics to Colombia itself, but to the Santa Marta region itself. And then from there, we went to uh, this Isla Salamanca, which is a huge wetland area again, um, uh, and a bit of a, um, a delta region um, estuary of the Magdalena River, uh, which flows in here. And, and by the way, this Cauca Valley down here, where we spent our first week was in this, the mountains around this Cauca Valley. Um, then we traveled, um, so that river, that Cauca River travel, flows down through here and eventually is a tributary of this Magdalena River that comes out there. So we kind of reconnected with, uh, with that river uh, as we came down there. And then we flew back from Barranquilla. Cartagena was a, a side trip that we we opted out of and chose an extra day in the El Dorado Lodge here up in the uh, Santa Marta Mountains because uh, it's one of the birdiest places in the world. We, we thought, well, a nice colonial town to be fine, but we know colonial towns. <laughs> let's, let's move on. So here we go. So we're going to head off now to, no, like, oh, I'm having a little mouse trouble here. There we go. So here's our new guide. We met at the airport and, and guided us again, just as uh, Jose was a fantastic host uh, and our concierge, as Ian had, had elaborated on. Uh, Angel was a fantastic uh, birder and, and just a, a great person. I spoke to him last week and uh, got some more information from him and just uh, see, to see how they were doing down there. Columbia is, by the way, having uh, I think they're one of the hardest hit places with COVID-19 uh, in the world. They're having real trouble there, but he and his family and friends are, are hanging in there. So they're, they're doing the best they can uh, in that situation. So here we are at uh, Los Flamencos uh, uh, Sanctuary, right on the coast of the Caribbean. You can see these young lads. Uh, you can see the coast here. There's big, huge mud flats and uh, fishing dugout canoes uh, right on the, edge of this Guajira Desert. So the desert's right on the edge of the ocean. Quite a fantastic uh, place. And scarlet ibises are going to show up in a minute here, but here's some of the traditional fishing techniques. Um, you know, this is a, called a cast net. This, uh, it's a weighted net that you have to have a lot of skill to flip out and catch fish that these kids have chased in with this other net for this guy to, to gather up and, uh, and sell at market or eat themselves. So here's a scarlet ibis. Now I think Mike uh, Ferguson took this picture. He took uh, a number of the pictures on this trip as well. Uh, he had a super zoom camera. So this is actually a very long shot and you can see it looks a little bit uh, hazy because of the heat waves. It was very hot and taken across mud flats, but a fantastic shot of these scarlet ibises among white ibises and snowy and great egrets. Very exciting to just, you know, every moment there was something different happening on this trip, uh, whether it was the people, as Ian mentioned, uh, here's a, a shot with, uh, the, in this Wahira Desert, right on the coast, in, in the shadow of the Santa Martin Mountains, the rain shadow. It's very flat, arid, and uh, you can see the vegetation is uh, very, uh, sparse and, and all, you know, it's not green here at all. This is, is all mostly vegetation there is here, but it's just all dried up. There's a bit of a pond here in the background. You can see us out uh, walking across here. And this photo here is probably one of my favorites of the trip. I didn't take it, uh, but it's, uh, you know, of the indigenous peoples here. So we um, really, we really didn't connect too much with the people themselves. We did have some guides who were native, um, the indigenous people, the Wayu tribe, 
uh, and, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about them later, but it was just amazing that this land uh, was inhabited as, you know, this desert even uh, by these peoples, uh, sort of like in North America here, if you can think of, you know, the Arctic as being such an inhospitable place, and yet uh, the native peoples populated and not just populated, but were fantastic stewards of the land. And we owe to them uh, essentially the fantastic biodiversity we were still able to enjoy there, uh, despite the um, colonization of, of the planet by the you know Europeans and everybody else that you know we've really not uh, kept up that fantastic uh, tradition, um, and that's a shame. But just a, a fantastic uh, experience. You'll you'll notice my talk. This is Ian's talk, by the way. Uh, he put this um, presentation together and I'm following it, but I'm throwing in my flavor as well. I really appreciate uh, what Ian did put this together. Uh, as you can imagine, there were thousands of photographs <laughs> to go through and, uh, and he selected some wonderful ones that really give you a, a good taste of what's going on. So here again are some uh, of the buildings from the Wahir, uh, the Wayu people in this Wahira Desert and uh, sort of primitive uh, surroundings, but very, um, something very comforting about them. Uh, I don't know what it was, but that was just my feeling. And of course, deserts have these fantastic habitat. Uh, so we get a, this is another puff birdian showed you one from uh, the other region, uh, but this is a russet throated puff bird. And I'll show you a little collection again of birds that Ian selected and the, it was really amazing. A lot of birds had something read about them, of course. And so the descriptions of the birds, the birds' names often had uh, every combination uh, and uh, little nuance to the red um, moniker that you could find, russet uh, throated puff bird. And here's the red crowned woodpecker. Now, again, another one very much like our red bellied woodpecker. You can even see a red belly there, but a different species, even a different genus, in fact, but a very uh, closely related genus. Uh, and a green rumped parrotlet. Now that one doesn't have any red in it, <laughs> but uh, again, uh, very stark contrast to this desert. Uh, where there's these green birds in the desert, they stand out, What's, where's the camouflage here? But uh, again, some of their habitat, it, it would work quite well as camouflage. And as Ian mentioned, ant birds, uh, here we have a uh, white-bellied ant bird uh, giving really good views. And again, as Ian mentioned, uh, really great skulkers, very hard to find. Um, and one of the things that we were a bit, um, reticent about, uh, about this trip was, you know, in order for us to enjoy all, a lot of these birds, it required the guides to do a lot of use of, of recordings to call them out. And, you know, this ecotourism thing, you sort of wonder, well, gee, what is the, the real impact on these, uh, these poor creatures? It's so fantastic for us to see them, um, but there is a, is a cost to the, the birds themselves. Uh, this is a uh, straight-billed woodpecker, wood creeper. I was going to call it a woodpecker because it looks a lot like a woodpecker. I know as Ken uh, has been posting some uh, brown creepers, uh, and this is kind of similar in a way, except this is the size of a woodpecker, uh, and it actually acts a lot like a woodpecker. So they're, I don't think they're very closely related, but they have some similar behaviors and, and a bit of common morphology there, I think. And uh, not all birds are bright and, and beautiful. This is a, a very sedate uh, but uh, aristocratic looking pale breasted thrush. And another, another group of birds here. This is a pileated finch. Reminds me a bit of a cross between a ruby crowned kinglet and a chickadee, but it's more the size of a, uh, a small sparrow. Um, And this guy uh, has uh, fairly obviously just had a bath. This is a or Orinocan saltator. 
And here there's still some colorful ones around. This is a uh, yellow Oriole. And again, in the desert here, what's, what's this guy doing here? A Trinidad Euphonia. We had a number of Euphonias, uh, all look very similar, but there were differences. And perhaps the most sought after bird in the Wahir Desert, the Vermilion Cardinal. Looks a lot like our Cardinal, but on steroids. <laughs> uh, very difficult to see. It took us quite a while to find this bird, but it was well worth the, uh, the effort. So now we'll move on from that uh, Wahira Desert region, Los Flamencos Park, and we're, we're now going to this Tyrona National Park. This one was uh, highly touted on our uh, brochure and on our itinerary, uh, but when we got to, uh, I think maybe before we got there, they warned us um, that they actually, the park was closed. Uh, because of um, uh, the indigenous people uh, closed it for spiritual reasons. And you know, at first that seemed disappointing, but when you hear the spiritual reasons were really because of the sacredness of the forest uh, to these people. And so they're closing it to give the forest and its inhabitants time to rest and recover from um, the onsets, a lot of all of us tourists. So that was quite refreshing and that, that they had that power and that ability. Um, and I am hoping that we in North America will um, connect better with our indigenous people. This truth and reconciliation will, will come to better terms and, and come to appreciate uh, what we really have here. This is one of the reasons I went on this trip was to experience this biodiversity and to immerse myself in this. I, we didn't really get immersed in that culture, but just to find you know, what was going on there and, and how it might uh, impact us too. Uh, okay, so the next picture sort of, this is Angel. So the park was closed, but Angel lives in this community close to the park. And this is a photo of a, a native um, leader in the community and indigenous Wayu person. And Angel sort of, I think he kind of rubbed some shoulders and managed to sneak us in through some barbed wire uh, into a little bit of the park at least. And uh, on this leafy trail, we went up this leafy trail and experienced uh, a really interesting and fantastic group of birds called the mannequins. Now mannequins, you've probably seen videos of uh, break dancing, uh, moon dance, moon walking, <laughs> little birds on branches, just hyperactive. Uh, and this is, this is that group. Just uh, many are quite beautiful. They have specialized syrinxes that allow them to make a bizarre range of whistles, trills, and buzzes. Uh, they have often spectacular courtship behaviors and rituals involving these uh, dances and posturing, uh, each unique. Uh, this is a golden collared mannequin up in one of those Cecropia trees. Uh, Mike Ferguson said that, you know, these, this, this is a, an ecosystem in this tree. <laughs> there were Cecropia trees everywhere we went. And if you wanted to see an interesting bird, you just had to find a Cecropia tree and look in it. And there was something different there. It was quite amazing. Uh, and the mannequins were no exception. This is a white bearded mannequin. Uh, beautiful display. This is the one we climbed through the barbed wire fence that I ripped my pants on. Um, and just about impossible to get to see it. Uh, and here we weren't, the guide wasn't using any calls or anything like that. We were just observing and being, trying to be part of the, of the understory ourselves uh, and managed to sneak these glimpses. But you can imagine us all, um, you know, and Hal would find a, a view of it. And then it was, you, you had to be where his head was to see it. So there's the, the group of, uh, of us six trying to get our heads in there. And just to get a picture of this is just uh, amazing. And this is a uh, club winged mannequin. And it has extremely modified wing feathers, which it smacks together, making a sound like a firecracker going off. 
So we went further up to the trail to see this. And it was just amazing because you could hear these firecrackers going off, but you couldn't see anything. And what was happening was these little birds would sit on this branch, buried down in the understory, low, low in the ground, low to the ground. And then um, it would only be there for maybe a second and a half, two seconds. And then it would fly, uh, disappear from sight if you would manage to catch a glimpse of it there and jump into another spot and uh, flying, of course, there and smacking its wings like that firecracker. So you just hear this whack, crack, crack. Crack, crack, and and if you got a got your binoculars in that region and could see where it was, you just saw this little flash flashing back and forth and making these cracks. It was quite stunning, enchanting. So then we uh, had to leave the desert and moved on to uh, a hotel Finca Barlovento, where we uh, would. Uh, uh, set out from the next day to uh, make the arduous drive in the uh, four-wheel drive vehicles up to the El Dorado Lodge high in the Santa Marta Mountains on those rugged mountain roads like uh, I think they were even more rugged than the ones in the Andes at the Montezuma Lodge in Tatama National Park. But en route we were uh, delighted when our driver um, uh, let us off at this beautiful hotel on the beach and there was some beautiful birds in the gardens again. We could just relax and enjoy uh, ourselves without being too serious about the birding. Uh, it was pretty intense, the birding. <laughs> I think I was uh, um, getting a little bit uh, sleep deprived with because uh, we were up at the crack of dawn, before the crack of dawn to get out birding every day. And then we'd sit around and, and count the birds at night, tally them all up and so on. So it was a pretty demanding trip, but well worth it. So the, as we drove up uh, just above Minca, which is a, a town low in the uh, Santa Marta Mountains, uh, just part way up there, uh, there was this uh, driver stopped and we saw this beautiful black and white owl. There were two of them um, roosting in this tree. I think they were probably a common attraction. I don't know whether they were baited or whether they uh, had a, just had a line on these guys. So here we go. This is, if you had to choose only one place in Colombia to bird, uh, and I'm, my apologies uh, to our Colombian guest <laughs> um, from the Amazon, which we just missed the Amazon because we didn't have time for it. But if you had to go to one place, I think this uh, would be a fantastic spot to go. The El Dorado Lodge and the Santa Marta Mountains. So this is the flagship reserve of Pro Aves, which is the Colombia's main bird conservation group. And it's uh, situated at 1900 meters elevation, uh, which is pretty high. Um, and there's a rough, the very rough road to get there. And uh, we actually went up quite a ways above that, up to about 2800 meters to Cyril Kennedy. Um, and that's where we saw some of the, the birds you'll see coming up. So this is uh, the group of us at the lodge. Uh, this is the big decks they had uh, with all kinds of hummingbird feeders around it. As you can see, the, the building in the background is the um, where the dining room was and the, the reading, the lounge and so on for the, for the large, the kitchen. So that's the, uh, the deck with some, you can see some hummingbird feeders down here and they were all around this deck. Um, oh yes, and then the, the Kogi Habs, we actually, we changed our itinerary, as I mentioned, to uh, avoid, uh, not avoid Cartagena, but to spend another day in uh, this. And, and they, they bumped us out to these uh, amazing Kugi, Hog, Kugi Hobbs, which is the traditional uh, YU shelter design. I mean, this is a, a modernized, high, heavily <laughs> um, techno uh, version of it, but it was really a spectacular uh, spot to spend uh, a few days. It was a uh, about a 15 or 20 minute walk to the, uh, the lodge for meals and stuff, but it was well worth it. Some of the views from the, the Kogi Hobbs and some of the rough roads that we uh, walked along, but as you said, it was mostly downhill, so it was good. We did pick a couple uphill spots uh, because it was pretty rough riding in the, uh, the four by fours. 
So the, as I mentioned that the Santa Marta mountains have some endemics to Santa Marta, uh, the Santa Marta mountain range themselves. So this is a, a prime example, the Santa Marta brush, brush finch. And so there's a few uh, examples here, the Santa Marta bush tyrant. So we saw that one at the highest elevation we visited um, and only briefly, but some really beautiful views of it. Uh, Stunning little bird in a reserved way. And again, as Ian mentioned, there's um, wood wrens for every, every uh, elevation and every habitat, and this is uh, no exception. So the Santa Marta wood wren. And here are the Santa Marta parakeets. And, and as I, I don't know if anyone noticed that other picture of the parakeets that uh, Ian showed, uh, but there were actually two parakeets in that picture, but the only one really stood out. And here, I don't know how many you'll be able to count. I think there's around six in that photo, but they're pretty hard to spot. <laughs> but we enjoyed them greatly. And of course, there's all the different tanagers and, and thrushes and things. This is a yellow-legged thrush. So quite a stunning thrush, much different than our thrushes. Uh, well, robins are pretty colorful, but this guy, I think, uh, is, is, is a little bit more stunning. Um, Lunaped chlorophonia. And a slate-throated red star. And then another group of birds that, uh, you know, you have to see when you go to the tropics, they're really spectacular, are the, uh, this is a white-tipped quetzal. Uh, now it's even more colorful if it had turned around, <laughs> But actually, this, this might even be a female. I'm not sure because the uh, next slide um, is uh, a photo of Jim uh, helping this little uh, baby white tipped quetzal, which was nesting very close to the lodge. Uh, and this guy had left the nest a little bit too early and was in, in the rain was kind of a little bedraggled and there were some jays around. So. Uh, by the way, uh, our, our buddy Jim is a, a veterinary pathologist, so he was well <laughs> equipped to, and thought, thoughtful to pick this up and put him off in, in some cover at the side of the road so that the parents could hopefully care for him and uh, keep those uh, jays away. And Quetzals and Trogons are in the same family. Uh, Quetzals tend to be larger and showier, but some of the Quetzals can uh, also uh, do themselves justice here. So this is a pretty striking um, gartered trogon. I think I misspoke there. I meant to say trogons can <laughs> stand up for themselves too. It's quite beautiful. And uh, security, as Ian mentioned, was uh, we were never too worried. There was always armed guards, uh, you know, looking after us. Uh, we knew we were in, in good hands. This uh, three-year-old with a machete was a, a prime example that uh, one of the little fincas uh, near El Dorado, where they're all, all the way up the mountain, up and down the mountain on these roads are these little fincas or farms uh, where the families are eking out a living. And uh, one thing that helps them is our ecotourism. Uh, so the guides would stop here. They set up the uh, same kind of feeders, the fruit feeders and hummingbird feeders. So we would, uh, you know, collect half a dozen or a dozen or two uh, of of lifers in this uh, this these spots as well as we stopped. Just amazing and and get fresh bananas. I, I can't, Ian mentioned the food. The fresh local food. I I mean I think really we shouldn't be eating bananas here because of the uh, environmental um, impacts they uh, banana plantations have on the ecosystems down there, but uh, there it was just it wasn't wasn't the same banana at all. <laughs> uh, just fantastic. So we were, uh, as Ian mentioned, we walked a fair bit and we spent three fantastic days uh, up at this El Dorado Lodge, um, and then we started to descend. Uh, back down through Minca to Santa Marta, uh, where we were gonna stay overnight and then head over to the uh, 
uh, what was it called? Isla Salamanca National Park, that's it. Um, so on the way down, we had the opportunity to walk through some other elevations and pick up even more species than we had in the days at the higher altitudes of these coffee plantations. And um, here's a pair of orange chinned parakeets at their nest. And one of the most stunning sparrows you'll ever find, the golden winged sparrow. That's a quote from our friend Mike, the uh, nouveau birder. Mike, by the way, is, is probably the most avid birder amongst us <laughs> and uh, the shortest uh, time birding. I think in 2014 or 15, when, when uh, Ian first met Mike, Mike had been birding for about a year, I think, in 2015. So. He's, uh, he's quite an amazing fellow. We uh, really enjoy his company. And uh, uh, I'm not sure Ian didn't mention this, but we did see a lot of our familiar friends from home when we were down there. So you may recognize this. I'll give you a moment to uh, uh, identify that as a, a black Bernian warbler. And uh, there's quite a list of uh, local birds that we saw down there that migrated down to and through Columbia. Uh, and we by no means saw all of the ones that we could have seen. Uh, we were of course focusing on the Colombian birds, the, the native birds uh, and uh, endemics, a lot of them, but not, not all of them, of course. So we were quite a, it was delightful to come across and quite refreshing that, hey, I, I know that. <laughs> I can identify that one. And we even saw one that um, that our one of our guides had never seen before that Angel hadn't seen. There, I can't remember which one it was. Uh, some it was a blackbird, but uh, in any case, it was pretty, pretty cool. So we were able to point out one to him that he hadn't seen it. It was a lifer for him. <laughs> uh, so here we are at uh, Isla Salamanca. So it'd be a bit like Tiny Marsh, a bit. Uh, in that there were a lot of dikes and, uh, and walkways, uh, paths to walk along through this mangrove swamp, which again was this uh, estuary or, or um, delta of this uh, Magdalena River in, uh, in right near the, on the coast essentially, uh, the Caribbean coast. And so there were uh, some amazing uh, birds there again, another completely different habitat. This is where this uh, bug shirt I was wearing, this has got some bug repellent in it, uh, came in handy in the, uh, the deep because there were lots of little noceums here biting. Uh, but that was the only place we really ran into any kind of biting insects, to, but despite our malaria shots and, and all the deep we brought with us and so on. Uh, so here's a, a really cool bird and it's one of the Anseriform uh, I don't, I don't think that's just a family. That's a big group of birds that includes ducks and geese and so on. Doesn't look much like a duck or a goose. Uh, really cool bird, very, very interesting. And another great bird that looks a little more familiar to you. This is a rufescent tiger heron. So it's a, a little heron like our, a little bit like our little green heron, but uh, uh, quite different. And here's a yellow hooded blackbird. A bit like our yellow blackbird, but again, different. And a white-headed marsh tyrant. And this is his nest or her nest. I don't know which that one was, but uh, it's a little bit like a squirrel's dray. Uh, there's a, a little hole that he climbed into or she in and out of. Uh, pretty neat to be able to see that as well. There were a couple of marsh tyrants. This is one of them. And then this shot symbolizes the end of our trip. Um, we're leaving these rich wetlands full of egrets and stilts and heading towards the urbanization of Columbia, represented by this massive bridge construction uh, on the way to Barranquilla. So this is bridges over the Magdalena River. We didn't drive on it. Of course, you can see a bit of a gap there and here, uh, but uh, we headed off. We left the mountains already. We left our beautiful Kogi halves and beautiful sunrises and sunsets. Looking over the mountains. Just some 
stunning shots. Uh, and I can't uh, compliment the photographers enough, uh, Mike and Virgil and, uh, and Jim and, and myself. <laughs> like I didn't get very many good pictures actually. I, I tried to take too many <laughs> and uh, but some of those were mine. Uh, so that ends our fantastic trip. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to relive that for you. And I hope we communicated some of the excitement and just the awesomeness of that, that trip. Thank you very much, Chris and Ian. Can you hear me there? Yeah. Okay, I'm not sure if my, I don't seem to be on camera. Let's see. Um, yeah, I can see you. I gotcha. Oh yeah, I have to Good. open this up, I think. Anyways, that was great. Um, I'm going to suggest, uh, I don't see too many questions in the chat function, but if anybody has any questions, they can type them in there. Or uh, we're not that big a group. Uh, if people want to just to, um, to unmute themselves and shout a question out, we can give that a try as well. I'll stop sharing and that'll give us a better <clears throat> new chat. Yeah, somebody, mentioned, some, somebody mentioned when did we go and I apologize I had it on one of the slides but I didn't mention it it was February of 2019 so uh, don't remember the exact dates but in the middle of February and I have a question in the chat from Barb um, uh, the um, I think you might have mentioned but how long a trip was it it was just over two weeks it was from the 9th of February to the 24th I have a question. This is Jessica. How did you plan your trip? Did you pick target species and then destinations or did you pick destinations and then just were happy with the species you got? Well, yeah. Alex, Hills, uh, he came up with the idea. This was a dream of his and uh, he flew it by us, uh, Ian and, and Mike and I, I think it was on our, uh, our trip in Manitoba and uh, so this was kind of his dream and he took the initiative and and looked at different um options we we were thinking of you know trying to self-guide our trip and and we pretty quickly came to the conclusion that that was going to be extremely difficult uh to do and be effective uh and we we really didn't even appreciate how true that was until we got there <laughs> and uh you know we initially uh with our guides for example um so alex just to answer your question more briefly alex went through and 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 picked this out i'm not sure how he picked out this particular guiding uh tour guide i think he got a recommendation from a colleague or from somebody at uh the OFO or something like that. I can't remember for sure, but that's how we picked the guiding company. And then we, we sort of selected from them. They have uh, a selection of different tours and, you know, we could have extended it for another week or two and done the Amazon and other places. But of course we had a limited amount of time. So that's how we came up with that. Uh, and we were so fortunate as, as Ian said, our guides were just spectacular. The, it was, it's a Colombian company, um, uh, Christopher Colonia, he's the, uh, the owner operator of it. And he grew up, um, he's not, he's a, uh, uh, a col col colonial person. He's not a native uh, Colombian, but he, he grew up in Colombia. That's where his family is. Um, so yeah. There's a question in the chat, Chris, from um, Margaret and Reed. It might be a tough one to answer, but I, I was curious as well. Uh, they say, what was the cost? Uh, and I know half the time when you're on this type of trip, you really don't stop and count the cost, uh, but maybe just give people a rough idea of what to budget for this type of trip. Yeah, it was, uh, I think it was about $5,000 US for the trip, like, and it was all inclusive, except for tips and things like that. So, and our flight down there. So, and our return flight. So uh, overall, probably about $6,000 US. I haven't done it to the penny. Do you have a better fix on that, Ian? No, I was hoping you did, but I was also going to say about the same amount. Yeah. I, yeah. I would just say that, and I mentioned this to Christopher when he wanted some feedback on the trip, is um, it was 
pretty much all inclusive except tips, but tips A added up and B were often inconvenient. Um, we didn't carry a lot of cash and the tips of course uh, needed to be in cash. And sometimes uh, it would be late at night, for example, when one driver would leave and another driver would um, come on board. And so we were scrambling around at 10 o'clock at night, trying to gather up enough uh, Colombian pesos to uh, pay, you know, well-deserving tips to these drivers. So I mentioned to Chris that I would include that in the price and dole it out as uh, he saw fit. Well, that leads me to my question too, because the way you two just described this trip, everything seemed to be just perfect. I mean, the sun was always shining and uh, uh, I, uh, I, I realized Ian organized the whole thing. So probably everything was perfect, but was there anything you would complain about besides tips? Not very much. The, wow. You know, even when it rained, it was warm and it never rained and it was never torrential and never, uh, all day and uh i mean it ran i've i've said this often to many people it ran smoother than a trip like this would run here in canada as far as connections flights um accommodations it ran really smoothly yeah flights were all on time the the only we did change our itinerary as i mentioned the only complaint i had would have had was that our trip down the mountain from uh, the El Dorado Lodge, we, we got to a, a bar close to Minka and we, we spent several hours there. <laughs> um, and it was kind of awkward because we were all tired <laughs> and uh, you know, it just, I, I found that a bit of a strain. Um, so that didn't flow very well. And that's because we changed our itinerary and they didn't really have time to put enough good stuff in the itinerary from what they had originally set up. And it also uh, put a little kick in our, our accommodations the next day, which were supposed to be at uh, uh, Hotel Mercure, I think in Santa Maria, um, in Santa Marta. And it was a different hotel. And, and again, we had to wait to get into the room and stuff. So there was some hiccups there, but that was due to the fact that we made a fairly last minute change. But, but I would just say that, you know, it was a bar, it had <laughs> uh, a hammock and cerveza. So I was good. <laughs> and we have a question in the chat from Susan Hurst. Uh, what was your total trip count? How many endemics? In a tough one. <laughs> you remember? I, Chris? <laughs> I think we got right around 600 species. Oh my gosh. That sound about right, Chris? I think so, yeah. I think, yeah, that was I think I, we all had slightly different counts because we only counted what we actually saw. So I'd say 600. I had been, I've been many several times to Costa Rica, but never to South America. And about 400 of them were uh, lifers for me. And I think I had somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 45 endemics. Yeah, I had, uh, I was probably had the most lifers there. I think I had well over uh, 500 lifers and um, I, again, I don't know how many endemics. I mean, it really, it really didn't matter in the end. Of, it was we had our our checklist here was uh, was like 20, 24 pages long, twenty two pages long. Uh, now we didn't get everything on the checklist. There were a th over a thousand birds that we had the potential to see, a thousand different species, and Colombia has over two thousand species that you might see. And of course, some of those are migratory birds and so on, but a lot of them are um, native birds, if not endemic birds. So uh, it was it was just spectacular. And of course, our focus was on endemics and uh, native Colombian birds. So something uh, that um, if you're um, interested in going down there that I think might be significant is that um, I mentioned that Virgil had been to Ecuador and Peru on that's two different trips and he still managed 
I think in the neighborhood of 150 lifers. So birds he saw on this trip that he did not see in Peru or Ecuador. And he was very impressed with the trip as well. Yeah. We, we booked with, um, our flights were with Copa Airlines and they were, they're the most, or they were at least, I'm not sure if they still are, but they were the most punctual airline in the world. So uh, we were very uh, impressed. It was a fairly inexpensive, we booked really early, like about a year ahead of time, as far ahead as we could. And we got a uh, good, good price on the flights. The flights were around, I think around $800. Canadian uh, return. So we were quite happy with that. Well, I think uh, um, great presentation, guys. Uh, great um, first um, Zoom meeting for the Midland Penetanguishing Field Naturalists. Thank you very much. I want to let people know it's, it's hard because some people are watching as couples, but I think we had over, over 40, maybe 42, 44 people on the meeting. Uh, so very pleased with that. Um, I did um, record this and um, I'll be, hopefully if it works, I'll be sending all the club members a link. So if you, if you came late or, um, or if uh, people weren't able to uh, attend tonight, they'll be able to um, watch the recording of the meeting. The only thing I did, I did forget to start the recording until about uh, three, two or three minutes in. So people that were here tonight got the full thing. Uh, I, I wanted to mention to people that um, we did um, pay Chris and Ian for this presentation, but they um, elected to donate their payment to the, uh, to the uh, was it to the Nottawa Sagabelli Conservation or? Um, to the Baldwick Bluff. Um, to the Baldwick Bluff's new uh, property. Property, which, uh, which has been acquired now. And uh, so the, gener the donation was well received and that property is now uh, protected. Uh, and, uh, and it's, it's adjacent to the um, Hodgson property. So there's about a hundred hectares now uh, and they're working on, on more property. In the, and this is adjacent to, and part of, like some of these properties, they overlap the Minnesing wetlands, but they're, they also uh, go just outside. So we're getting a bit of a better buffer zone for protecting the Minnesing wetlands. So thank you very much for that. So it was a win-win all around. We got this wonderful presentation and the uh, Baldwick Bluffs got, got a little bit of money to help uh, preserve that habitat. Um, I wanted to remind people, is Kate Harries there? Kate, do you want to speak up and do a little promo for our next meeting, which is, I think it's in two weeks time. Can you hear me, Kate? Yes, can you hear me? Yep, yeah, we can see you. Oh, or, hi. What are you going to tell us about in a couple of weeks? So uh, I went to uh, the Sierra Madre of Mexico uh, in uh, November last year to uh, witness the uh, butterfly, uh, the monarch butterfly um, uh, wintering. And um, so uh, I'm going to tell you about that. It's uh, a species we all think we know, but we don't. There is so much to learn. And I learned a bit. I met scientists down there who were doing research. I climbed to the top of over 10,000 feet mountain where the oxygen is not very good. And I didn't think I was going to make it. Um, and it was a, a very exciting adventure and a very uh, moving uh, encounter with a, a species that uh, um, one just becomes very attached to. So I'll tell you about that. Yep. We'll get that, we'll get that organized. And I, I haven't got the date in my mind, but I know it's two weeks from tonight, right? Something and, like that. Uh, Susan, did you want to say good night to people? Susan Hurst? Hold on. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was busy writing. That was wonderful presentation. Again, thank you very much, guys. And um, thank you for everybody that, uh, that joined us tonight. And we will, uh, we will do more of these for sure. Um, thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Yeah. And uh, remember, we have an outing tomorrow morning at Tiny Marsh, 10 a.m. Um, join us there if you can. I, I don't think we can promise you as many birds as Chris and Ian <laughs> would do. But, uh, but we always see something. We so, might see that strange one that somebody posted in Simcoe County birding. What was it? A, some kind of a pheasant? Oh, uh, yeah, somebody black, saw a black pheasant down black there. Pheasant? They, that was pretty exotic. Well, they, they do, they were, 
they uh, they release a whole mix of birds. They're yeah. not just the uh, yeah. Yeah, I know it's it's destined to be shot probably at some point. <laughs> okay, okay, on that cheerful note. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good, Good night. night. Good night. Thank you. Thank Good night, you. everyone. Good night. Eight thirty one.